What's going on guys, it's Fred again, and welcome to the hobby. A lot has happened since our last update, including the US presidential election and everything that a Joe Biden win entails, an unfortunate resurgence of virus cases across the world, but with some good news regarding some possible treatments surfacing as well, among other things. So with all this in mind, for this investment update, I'm going to first briefly go through last month's stock picks in terms of how well they perform and my opinion of them moving forward, followed by several stocks I've more recently bought and some more that I'm close watching, and lastly, even some alternate non-stock investments of mine that have been doing well as of late. Before we start though, as a disclaimer, what I'm about to share here is merely my personal opinion and is for entertainment purposes only, meaning that you should definitely not make your own investment decisions based solely on these opinions and should always do your own due diligence. And with that, let's get started with the video. It's showtime! First, here's an overview of the stocks I highlighted and bought last month, which are in no particular order, Microsoft, um, Intel, Activision Blizzard, Cisco, and Pfizer. Nice. Nice! First off, nothing much has really changed for Microsoft's overall narrative, except perhaps the newest generation of their video gaming console, the Xbox Series X, has its release. But even if it does worse than expected against Sony's PlayStation 5, I still don't see it impacting the overall company and stock price too much, as some of their plans for gaming, such as those from their acquisition of Bethesda, are still very much in the works. And as for Microsoft's stock price, I did previously say that I was interested in buying more shares if the price went down to the support level at roughly $200 or so, which it did actually hit in early November, and thus I did in fact add a few more shares to what I already owned. Currently, it is hovering around the low 210s, and moving forward, my criteria for buying the stock is largely the same. If it continues to stay or dip to the low 200 range, I'd be very happy to add more shares to my portfolio to hold it for the long run. Next, as for Intel, I had bought shares before its earnings and its competitor AMD's earnings as its stock price gradually ran up to the low 50s right beforehand in anticipation of some optimism following some a couple of not so ideal quarters. By by the way, I don't typically play earnings reports and if anything will buy very cautiously and dollar cost average before and after the fact. Of course! Anyway, earnings came out for Intel and it actually got beat down to the mid 40s, upon which I did add a few more shares in my position because the earnings report was actually quite good in my opinion, with beats all around, but the stock may have priced in too much optimism, and also possibly of note is that its data center business didn't do as well as analysts had predicted. So overall, I am slightly down on my position, however, my view of Intel still hasn't changed because I think it'll be able to continue to bounce back against AMD. Not to mention, its stock price is again on the rise, currently sitting in the high 40s. Next, as for Activision stock, not too much has happened with the company as of my last update. If anything, it saw a slight drop as portfolios sort of rebalance um, out of stay at home stocks and into return to normal stocks with the vaccine news, and I'll talk more about those later. Now, I was able to add a few shares to my position as it dipped from the mid 80s to around the mid 70s, but based on my overall cost basis, which is about um, $50, I'm still very much up on Activision stock. They did just release a new game, which I'm actually currently playing, called World of Warcraft Shadowlands, and from what I can tell, it's actually shaping up to be a very popular and well received release, and on top of that, the company has continued to do some more um, restructuring and streamlining, which I think largely bodes well for its future. Next, onto Cisco stock. Since I bought this back in October, I am now up around 11% on my position, which I'm obviously very pleased about. So initially, it had been beaten down earlier this year, likely due to fewer businesses needing network infrastructure for their offices, as many employees transitioned to working from home. But more recently, it not only beat on earnings, but also put forth a fairly optimistic forecast as it transitions to more software-based businesses, on top of the fact that vaccines seeming imminent could actually mean greenlighting at least some employees returning to their offices to work, upon which 5G infrastructure could especially come into demand. This along with Cisco's attractive dividend yield of over 3.5%, among other things, so makes it undervalued in my opinion, and thus I will strongly consider adding to my position if the stock price sees any more significant dips along the way. Finally, moving on to Pfizer, and I'll also discuss a couple of related stocks, mine gains on this one are largely flat, 
But there is a lot going on with this company right now and its stock price could really go either way, although I do see a lot more upside. For example, after they announced that their vaccine was over 90% effective, and by the way, to my knowledge, they're the first major pharmaceutical company to pretty much complete late stage testing, let alone have such high efficacy with their vaccine. And so the stock price actually popped quite a few percentage points with that announcement, alongside the sort of wave of confidence and optimism coming back to the so-called return to normal normal life businesses and stocks such as AMC theaters, Win Resorts, and Boeing. However, with Moderna, their competitor, essentially one-upping Pfizer by not only announcing 94% efficacy with their vaccine, but also saying that their vaccine can actually be stored in essentially refrigerators as opposed to fibers which supposedly requires special extremely low temperature storage, Pfizer's stock price once again saw quite a significant drop back to where it was before it had announced these test results. No! God, please, no! 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 Now, along with Moderna and Regeneron, who just received FDA approval for its antibody cocktail given to President Trump when he contracted the virus, Pfizer is still looking like a good opportunity, in my opinion, at this price, especially if they can overcome some of the hurdles they have had um, with storage and distribution. By the way, Pfizer, to my knowledge, is the first company to apply for emergency use authorization, abbreviated EUA, with the FDA, the approval of which could be a decent catalyst for the stock price as well with Moderna following not far behind with their schedule. Before we get into the next section, here's a friendly reminder that as of the recording of this video, the free trading platform and app Weeble is actually giving away not two, not three, but four free stocks valued up to $1,600 each, two when you open an account, and two more when you deposit at least $100. If you want, you can literally sell the stocks that they give you right away, like I did, and the best stocks I've received was Snapchat, which is currently valued at over $40, and the worst has not been valued below $8 or $9. So that's definitely some decent free money that you can even use towards other things. Why make trillions when we could make billions? Moving on to the stocks that are at the very top of my watch list, we actually first have a Singaporean company that is listed on the New York Stock Exchange called C Limited, ticker symbol SE, formerly known as Garena Interactive Holding. I really like it as a growth play because it's not only well positioned in the e-commerce space, but also mobile and PC games, which are both great stay at home and um, fast growing industries, being the largest e-commerce platform and gaming licensor and developer in the um, Southeast Asian region as well as Taiwan, where I actually currently live, so I have actually used its platforms and witnessed their explosive growth. First of all, in terms of e-commerce, it owns the Shopee platform, which is frankly one of the best online shopping experiences I've ever had. And this is coming from somebody who has lived in the States and used Amazon and eBay extensively. In fact, in just a few short years here in Taiwan, Shopee has quickly overtaken all the existing e-commerce platforms as by far the number one player. And one of the reasons is that it's extremely easy to sell something on Shopee, even with just your smartphone. First of all, Shopee uniquely collaborates with convenience stores such as 7-Eleven, which are extremely prevalent here in Taiwan and in Southeast Asia, where for example, you can literally ship a product you've sold hassle-free and even without paying for shipping at one of these convenience stores. It's literally almost as easy as just packaging your product and dropping it off at one of these stores. And this has even incentivized myself to start a side hustle selling collectibles, but that is a topic for another video. So I'm not going to get into too many of the details because I don't want to bore you, but in essence, through their system, Shopee not only makes it extremely easy for sellers to list, sell, and ship products, and buyers to collect their parcels very safely at one of these convenience stores, but because they've also added additional almost social media-like features and game-like features to their app, such as shops being able to share posts and promotions like with Instagram, and there being um, daily points you can actually collect to redeem vouchers and other things with, making it yet a different experience from their website, and really just a super fun and entire experience for people to want to spend additional time on Shopee on their phones and to obviously buy tons more stuff on the go and outdoors as opposed to just shopping online through their computers at home. And e-commerce is not even everything they've got going for them because they also own Garena which is sort of like Steam where users log into their platform to play PC games and mobile games of all sorts, some of which are proprietary meaning that Garena themselves develop those games as well as other games that they distribute in Asian regions including 
usually popular ones like League of Legends and Call of Duty Mobile. Taking a quick look at whether the company's stock price is valued fairly, it's a bit hard to say at this moment because they are not yet profitable so we don't yet have a PE ratio, but what we can see is that their market cap has been growing considerably over the past few years, going from 14 billion in September of 2019 to 75 billion exactly a year later. Their revenue has also grown significantly, but the company has only had negative earnings for quite a while. However, this is likely due to the sheer amount they're spending on expansion, which seems to be very successful so far. And what's more is that their total cash balance still exceeds their debt by over a billion dollars, meaning that they shouldn't be at too much risk when it comes to paying off debt. However, due to the stock price being near all-time highs and it having quadrupled in just a few short months, I will definitely be very cautious when buying this by making proportionally much smaller purchases at all-time highs such as now and larger ones during corrections. On to the next stock I'm buying and actually already bought, we have vegan meat juggernaut Beyond Meat, ticker symbol BYND, which is another company which I've even witnessing growth and expansion on this side of the planet quite far from the United States. A few months ago, its stock price hit all-time highs of over 800% up from its IPO price, but recently has gotten beaten down to around the $130 support level, which in my opinion presents a buying opportunity. And I was able to get in at around $118 right after a disappointing earnings for which it reported more losses than analysts had expected, after which the stock has rallied to over $130. However, despite a not so ideal earnings, the company has reiterated that this is but a mere setback in the grander scheme of things, especially with the virus still running rampant and impacting both dining and um, retail revenues, and that they remain very optimistic and focused on the future. Speaking of which, Beyond Meat has already been able to expand rapidly and gain widespread adoption from popular restaurants and retailers, with its reach being more than 84 countries. In fact, all the way across the globe here in Taiwan, although Beyond Meat products still aren't particularly common, likely since the market here is very much used to inexpensive and tasty pork to the point that it's almost part of the culture here, still I have seen some adoption and tryouts in certain fast food restaurants for example, including popular Japanese fast food chain Moss Burger, which stands for Mountain Ocean Sun by the way, as an appetizing as moss sounds, and the other night I was also pleasantly surprised by my order of a Beyond Meat curry at a different restaurant which costed me about um, $10 US, which is a fair price for a plate of curry here by the way, and tasted delicious. And beyond territories such as mine where its products are yet to have a lot of adoption, in the United States we can pretty safely say that it has nearly reached mainstream adoption with collaborations that are still rapidly expanding with major retailers like Walmart and popular fast food chains like um, Pizza Hut and McDonald's. Plus, they also have huge plans with the Chinese market, having already partnered with Alibaba, which is a company I will talk about very soon in this video, and Yum Brand's own restaurants, KFC, Pizza Hut, and Taco Bell in China. Now, as for a couple of potential headwinds for the company, there are a couple of competitors in the fake meat market who have also grown tremendously as of late, such as Impossible Foods and Tyson Foods, but it doesn't really seem like they will have um, the same foothold as Beyond Meat, especially in international markets. But what I do have to point out as something that makes me think twice before going ham or vegan ham as they like to put it, what? Um, investing into Beyond Meat, and that is profit margins, which seem to have stagnated because of factors like competition, but likely still mainly due to increased spending on expanding the company and gaining market share, which frankly has seemed to work quite well indeed, although I will be keeping a close eye on their earnings and market cap moving forward. And if you'd like to check out a more in-depth bullish thesis and opinion on Beyond Meat, which I personally have found to be quite informative and reassuring, I'll link Jeremy from the Financial Education channel's video on the company and the stock down in the description box below. On to the next stock, and I did say a talk about this one because the company is actually partnered with Beyond Meat, which is China's Alibaba, ticker symbol BABA. In terms of what the company does, it actually does quite a lot of different things, but it's perhaps the most well known for Taobao, which is essentially the Chinese equivalent to Amazon, and it's by far the largest e-commerce platform in China with over 70% market share. Not only that, but Alibaba actually operates a bunch of other successful businesses as well, including Xiaomi, which is very similar to Spotify, Youku, which is the counterpart to YouTube, and even a large cloud computing segment among other ventures. Speaking of resume, Alibaba 
Alibaba currently has a 33% stake in Ant Group, the parent company of Alipay, which is extremely popular in China as a digital wallet and payment platform somewhat similar to PayPal, but also allows one to easily pay their bills, book rides, um, book hotels, etc. all in one app. Now, Ant Group was actually spun off of Alibaba in an attempt to raise even more funds by having their very own IPO, but that's where they actually hit a bump in the road as essentially the IPO was denied by the Chinese government, allegedly because the founder of Alibaba, Jack Ma, criticized them for essentially over-regulating companies and thus stifling potential growth and innovation. Well, with the Chinese government essentially making the statement that they ultimately get the final say in apparently everything, Alibaba stock price also saw a pretty severe hit going from about $300 down to the 250s during which I did pick up a few shares and it has since recovered up to the um, $270 range with still a lot of upside to cover in my opinion up to and beyond the previous $319 high. And that is because I believe this stock is merely pricing in some uncertainty and fear which doesn't actually change the fact that the company is still growing earnings at an impressive rate and actually sports a relatively fair PE ratio at below 30. And so in my opinion, Alibaba is still in the dip buying range and I would be happy to slowly add to my position over time if this narrative and similar valuation continues. Moving on to the next part of this video, I'm going to briefly cover some stocks and trends and investments I'm watching very very closely but that I don't necessarily deem as must buys at these current valuations because of the sheer amount of hype among them. First, as you may or may not be aware, Bitcoin is currently flirting with new all-time highs only previously seen all the way back in 2017 during the whole cryptocurrency and mining phase and this time people are actually saying it could continue to trend up partly due to increase although still not super widespread adoption um, to my knowledge by um, large digital players such as PayPal and Square and even significant institutional investments in the cryptocurrency. Personally, I have a very small percentage of my portfolio currently exposed to Bitcoin as well as PayPal stock, which I picked up a few shares of when I corrected down to the low $180 range, after which I am now actually up significantly, but I'd gladly buy more shares if those levels present themselves again. Whether or not Bitcoin sees more mainstream adoption, my rationale is that having at least some exposure to it, which I'm still looking to increase by the way, gives you a chance to, so to speak, get a very significant return if Bitcoin quote unquote goes to the moon and in the case that it doesn't one shouldn't invest so much as to really care if it ends up flopping in the long run now if you like to invest in bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies i don't recommend buying them through robinhood because even though you can buy and sell on the app itself it's actually a huge hassle if you want to transfer your cryptocurrencies to say a wallet or someplace else and what's more is that by keeping your crypto in certain digital accounts you can actually even earn a decent amount of interest from them for example of up to 8.5 annually with BlockFi. Speaking of which, one of my favorite YouTubers, Andre Jik, actually just did a helpful video on how he bought and stored Bitcoin with BlockFi. And in case you're interested, I'll link that video down in the description as well. Next for some other somewhat speculative, super hyped up stocks and investments I'm paying very close attention to and have entire stock watch lists built out for them. We have some of the stocks that ARK Invest owns in a couple of their very popular ETFs, which include stocks like Tesla, Slack Technology, and Teladoc Health, just to name a few. And then there's also a whole slew of electric vehicle stocks such as Brookhorse and Hillion, which I'm currently invested in, that have been exploding in price and popularity as of late. And finally, we also have entire sectors such as travel and hospitality that would benefit from life returning to normal or near normal if these vaccines prove successful. Now, if you'd like to learn more about any of these stocks and investments, I'll also link in the description some other very helpful YouTube channels such as Zip Traders, who discusses these topics frequently and provide very up-to-date information regarding these types of opportunities. Finally, for just one more type of investment that I and I'm sure many others have been dabbling in, it is collectibles, more specifically Pokemon cards, which have largely spiked massively in price lately. Although some would argue that certain cards are probably overvalued and in a bubble as the Logan Paul and influencer hype cools down somewhat. I'll probably make a dedicated video on how I've been investing in them and do let me know in the comment section below. But essentially what I've been doing is sniping for both nostalgia and investments from eBay as well as Shopee. Especially since, as I mentioned, Shopee makes it really easy for me to list any um, of these cards should I choose to do so. And there is in fact a pretty thriving marketplace here locally for um, Pokemon cards. 
Now, if you're interested in doing this type of investment, and if perhaps Pokemon was also part of your childhood, I'll link up again Andre Jick's video on his Pokemon investments as well as a couple of other helpful Pokemon investing channels that cover this topic in a lot more depth. And with that, these are pretty much the most significant stocks and investments I either have been buying or are very much considering to purchase as we enter into the final month of 2020. Thank you so much for watching and be sure to pick up your 4 free stocks from Rebull. I wish you guys a safe and profitable holiday season. Consider subscribing to my channel if you'd like to see more hobby investing videos just like this. And I'll see you guys in the next video. Peace.